Hi, uh, welcome to this webinar and the launch of the latest uh, compendium focusing on, on, on Korea's foreign policy and competitiveness. Uh, my name is Chung Min Lee. I'm a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm joined by wonderful colleagues across the world. I am so sorry that it's 11 p.m. as we speak in Korea, and I believe, what, 10 p.m. or so uh, in Manila, and then, of course, local time here in D.C. and the East Coast is uh, 0900 in the morning. And so before I kick off, I'd like to ask all our panelists to give us, like, two second introductions of who they are, what they've done. And then when you're done with the introduction, I'll, I'll ask um, all of you to give us five minute presentations and then we'll continue. Let me briefly explain the rationale behind this compendium. When I was at uh, Carnegie several years ago, I began this compendium series. And we the first one was on Korean soft power, the second one on demographic cliffs, and this third one was on global competitiveness. So Hannah was critical in, in, in working closely with me throughout this, as was Jacob. And so we chose a number of different topics. The reason why I opted for the compendium, although other reports have come out and has come and, and are coming out, is because I wanted to move beyond the usual menu of Korean issues, whether it's you know Kim Jong-un's North Korean nuclear program, uh, the growing intensity of the US-China rivalry, the future of the alliance and so forth. Those are all critical issues. But I think our audience, both in the US and abroad, really do want to see a different angle of the Korean story. And so this is why I'm very, very, very lucky to have outstanding contributors. And so without further ado, let me just go down the line and begin with uh, Chung and Lee. Please tell us who you are and what you've done. Hi, um, thank you for this precious opportunity. Uh, my name is Jung Eun Lee. I'm a, a reporter in Dong Daily newspaper in South Korea uh, and worked in Washington for three years as a former uh, Washington correspondent. So um, I would like to discuss the global competitiveness of South Korea, uh, mainly based on my experiences and perspectives as a reporter. Okay, great. So, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. John, let, me, let me just go through all the uh, all the other panelists. Oh, and I'll get back okay. To you. Yeah. All right. So, Ju so Juhan, go ahead from Manila. Hello. Um, thank you, Professor Lee, for this wonderful opportunity. My name is Juhan Kim. I'm currently the country director of the Global Green Growth Institute uh, Manila office. Um, I've been working on the climate change and sustainable development issue for the last 15 years, uh, working currently with the Global Green Growth Institute, which is an intergovernmental organization working for climate change and net zero transition. And I also work for the United Nations Environment Program and other similar uh, institutes working on the climate change and the sustainable development issue. So I'd like to have a good discussion with all of you. Thank you for the opportunity. Right. Great. Um, of course, uh, Hannah, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Dr. Lee. My name is Hannah Anderson. Um, I was a junior fellow last year in the Carnegie Gaither Junior Fellows Program, where I worked in the Asia Program with Jacob, um, with professors, or with Dr. Lee and other scholars. Um, and I'm currently a Georgetown student at the School of Foreign Service in the Asia Program. Happy to be here. By the way, Hannah uh, is, is wonderful. She has a background in Asian studies. And I am I am certain that whatever she does, uh, she will outpace all of us in the in, in the years ahead, as will Jacob too. So Jacob, please go ahead. You're too kind. Um, uh, my name is Jacob Felgoiz. I am I was also last year a junior fellow in the Asia program along with Hannah, and I am currently a data research analyst at the Center for uh, Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown. Okay, great. So before we move on to uh, to, to Chung Un, there was another contributor, uh, Dr. Chung Gu Hyun, who wrote a really cogent essay on Korea's business uh, environment going forward. But he's traveling, unfortunately, so he won't be able to join us. So let me just go straight to Chung Un Lee and then tell us why you wrote your your article on Korea's place uh, in the world. Hmm. Yeah. Um, again, thank you for the 
opportunity to um, do the compendium together. Well, I just wanted to um, share my experiences and my thoughts uh, that I uh, had uh, in Washington. It was a great one. And well, uh, about the Korea's global competitiveness. Um, I think first and foremost, the economic power is definitely number one reason for South Korea to be one of the key player in global stage. Um, Korea is now ranked 10th largest economy in the world and the fourth in Asia. And especially in the era of global um, supply chain crisis due to the pandemic, Korean companies have more work to do now um, in operation with other companies, uh, like in its sole ally, the United States and the other partner countries like Japan and um, like ASEAN countries. So, uh, as you already know, Samsung was invited to the White House meeting to discuss the global supply chain crisis last year, and it has continued to other uh, to join the other meetings as well. Uh, the big companies like Samsung, Hyundai, LG announced a huge investment plan when the Korea-U.S. summit was held in Washington last year and uh, this year as well in Seoul. And President Biden kept um, saying thank you, thank you um, to the CEOs at the joint press conference in the White House in front of the camera. So um, I reported all those events and movements as a correspondent and reporter. Uh, it was relatively new and interesting experience, not only for myself, but also to my media colleagues, uh, because our main mission uh, has always been dealing with uh, the very traditional um, security, issues. yeah, like North Korea, nuclear, the U.S. alliance and things like that. And suddenly it, it switched <laughs> to the economy and then suddenly the Korea was in the middle of it. So even this year, after I came back to uh, Seoul, we saw President Biden uh, visit Samsung Semiconductor uh, Factory and his first destination right after he arrived uh, in Seoul last year uh, for his summit with President Yoon uh, was the uh, semi, uh, Samsung Semiconductor Factory, right? And uh, recently, President Biden visited SK Siltron CSS Factory in uh, the main... Uh, the mainland US. So it was really something. So all of this shows the growing tech alliance between the two countries, uh, the Korea, I mean, uh, the industry sector and the government all together now puts a very ambitious goal of becoming a global leader in future technology. And secondly, um, I would like to highlight South Korea's growing soft power. We call it K content. Uh, I'm sure you heard about the Squid Game, the Parasite. Uh, so it won the Academy Award. And it was uh, the first non-English film to uh, win the, uh, the prize for the year's best film. Then uh, this year, director Park Chan-wook's new movie, uh, we call it Heojil Kyoshim, A Decision to Live, joined the list of the 10 best movies selected by the New York Times. And director Park was named the best director at Cannes uh, Film Festival. So how about BTS? Uh, I don't even need to mention its global uh, popularity again here. You must have seen one of the BTS member Jungkook uh, doing his solo performance in Qatar World Cup opening ceremony. So all these achievements show the growing prevalence of Korea's K content power, I think. Uh, the soft power, as Professor Jos Joseph Nye highlighted. So uh, I think now the Korea should raise more voices, uh, play more roles in the global stage. I mean, um, the uh, growing global competitiveness is definitely an uh, asset and a liability at the same time. I mean, um, the Korea should now take more responsibility for the values we cherish whether it is a climate change or human rights, democracy or free press and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, to do this, I also wanted to point out the challenges that we face and problems that we should solve and parts that we, uh, may, we need to make progress. So one example, um, the Korea has been criticized about its reluctant attitude on 
uh, North Korean human rights issues, like uh, when we vote on UN's uh, resolutions. So it has been also very uh, sometimes cautious and hesitant about raising issues which could provoke China or Russia. For example, the situation in Xinjiang, uh, the human rights and uh, the situation in Ukraine, because these countries are big trading partner countries, I mean, China and Russia. So strategic ambiguity still means a lot for Korea, uh, a country sandwiched among big countries. But I think it is now uh, the time that the Korea should engage more, even when it has to deal with diplomatically thorny issues. Uh, now the UN administration publicly announced that it would uh, focus on value-based diplomacy. He emphasized protecting human rights, for example, as one of its core principles. So we'll see how it will be implemented and unfolded from now on. So these are uh, the reasons why I would like to uh, talk about our global competitiveness and the good things and bad things about um, these kind of things. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chuck. And we'll come back to you with, with other rounds of questions. And apropos your comment on North Korean human rights, we're talking about North Korean human rights. As you know, the Yun government just appointed a new ambassador for North Korean human rights, Yi Xin Hua, who is a professor at Korea University. And she, she was here in Washington, uh, precisely dealing with this issue over the last uh, couple of days. Mm. Let me turn to uh, Hannah and Jacob. And so Hannah, please go ahead and then follow up by Jacob on, on why your essay on comparing AI between Japan and Korea was so critical. Great, thank you so much again, Chung Ming. Um, so I'll just give a very brief overview of our paper, which compares South Korea's AI ecosystem with Japan's along three main key dimensions. So the first component, the first two components are semiconductors and cloud computing services, which are two ways of accessing computing power. So for semiconductors, we find that both Japan and Korea control critical segments of the supply chain. And for the cloud, we find that both countries have comparable strengths and weaknesses. And for the third component, we look at um, cutting edge AI research. And we show that South Korea has caught up to Japan, but it still lags behind China and the US. Mm -hmm. And we actually decided to compare South Korea's AI ecosystem to Japan because both countries are high tech regional powers in Asia. Mm -hmm. And they've also both identified innovation as the key to future economic growth and global competitiveness. And we know that AI is kind of a buzzword in the current foreign policy yeah. landscape, but we chose AI because of the extraordinary potential that it has to transform a country's competitiveness, whether that, whether that be in the defense sector, healthcare, or any other sector. Um, so first looking at semiconductors, which falls under computing power, we see that Japan and Korea have different niches within the semiconductor supply chain. So for example, Korea's strength lies in the fabrication of chips, as we all know. Um, Samsung from Korea and TSMC from Taiwan are the only two companies in the world that are able to fabricate cutting edge chips at scale. Um, however, Japan, their strength lies in SME or semiconductor manufacturing equipment and fabrication materials. So for SME, Japanese companies like Nikon, in addition to ASML from the Netherlands, produce much of the photolithography equipment. And we see Japanese companies like Tokyo Electron playing a really key role in deposition. And in addition, we see that Japan controls a large market share of these fabrication materials like wafers um, and photoresist as well, which are really, really critical inputs that go into fabrication. And I'll turn it over to Jacob now. Yeah, so, so thank you so much. So moving on to cloud computing, uh, we first looked at adoption. So the extent to which uh, South Korean and Japanese companies are purchasing these systems um, or purchasing these services. And we find that uh, the two countries are, are investing similar amounts in cloud computing services. Um, and that actually both countries are out investing China, at least as a share of GDP. We also looked at the extent to which South Korean and Japanese companies are able to purchase from domestic players. And what we found is that uh, this market, this cloud computing services market is very dominated by American companies like Amazon Web Services, like Google Cloud, um, and also some Chinese players like Alibaba. So uh, while both countries, uh, South Korea and Japan, are investing similar amounts in cloud computing, uh, they are also similarly reliant on foreign providers for these services. 
Moving on to our, our last uh, dimension, cutting edge AI research. What we did was we looked at AI academic conferences and the papers published at those conferences, which we weighted by basically how much those papers are cited as a uh, metric for quality. And what we find is that from 1990 to 2019, Japan had a lead over Korea in publishing these papers. Uh, uh, but then as of 2019, uh, you know, the gap slowly narrowed and eventually as, as of 2019, Korea caught up. So now they are essentially tied on this metric. Um, and so while they are, you know, essentially in line with one another now, uh, again, both South Korea and Japan still lag, lag behind the, the global AI research leaders, which are China and the United States. So to conclude with a few thoughts, uh, for South Korea and Japan to maintain or, or grow their advantages in AI innovation, they're going to need to continue investing in cutting edge AI research and also in these two methods of accessing computing power, semiconductors or cloud computing. But there are some global factors that risk derailing South Korea and Japan's efforts, most notably US-China tensions, which continue to grow over the semiconductor value chain. So for example, the, the new export, US export controls that uh, dropped in October, um, they will, among many other things, prevent uh, South Korean companies like Samsung from exporting the most advanced data center chips to China. And while they won't directly restrict semiconductor manufacturing tool makers like Tokyo Electron and Nikon from exporting to China, that could change. The U.S. government is lobbying the Japanese government, the, the Netherlands, uh, South Korea, and others on a bilateral basis. There's also negotiations through uh, multilateral fora, such as the CHIPS4 Alliance, which is this grouping of Japan, South Korea, the U.S., and Taiwan. Um, and, and so uh, South Korea and Japan will need to balance these pressures. You know, on one hand, they have uh, pressure from the United States government. They have their own domestic security concerns about China's military and economic power. And on the other hand, they need to consider the revenues that domestic companies uh, uh, get from their sales to China. So this is a tricky balancing act and, and how they choose to resolve this is going to be very impactful. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, of course, uh, Chuan Kim in Manila, please. Thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, in my paper, I try to assess South Korea's net zero transition. And I think South Korea has a competitive edge and potential to take a global leadership role in terms of tackling climate crisis and transitioning to a net zero economy. I have three points to share. Mm -hmm. The first point um, uh, that I wanted to address is that South Korea has already made critical policy achievements and their related experiences in terms of transitioning towards green economy. Like everybody knows, the rapid economic rise of South Korea as the um, 10th largest global economy as of today was deeply rooted in highly polluting manufacturing driven heavy industry. However, um, 14 years ago in 20, 2008, South Korea adopted the low carbon green growth as a priority national agenda which was phenomenal shift given its um, economic history, and then established a law on targets for reducing emissions and prioritizing green technology development. So in 2020, recently, the country declared carbon neutrality by 2050. In 2021, the National Assembly of South Korea codified it. And even amid the pandemic, the country implemented so-called the Green New Deal policy and committed around 61 billion US dollars to green economic sectors such as solar, wind, hydrogen, and electric vehicles. So there are um, enabling policy environment in South Korea. That's the first point. The second point, uh, South Korea has set up a robust target to join global net zero race. In 2021, the South Korea significantly raised the target of so-called nationally determined contributions, otherwise known as NDC of the Paris Agreement. The compared to the post-industrial economies, South Korea's NDC target is ambitious because it requires a steep annual average rate of greenhouse gas reduction from baseline year, which is 2018 to 2030, which is the NDC target year. What this means is like this, South Korea is peak year in terms of greenhouse gas emissions is the year 2018 with 
727 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And then country's 2030 NDC target is to emit 436.6 million tons. This means that the country needs to reduce emissions every year by 4.2% from the peak year to 2030. This is indeed a bold move compared to Japan's annual average rate of reduction of 3.6% and the US and UK's 2.8%. In 2021, um, South Korea also promised to end all new financing for overseas coal-fired power plants and also committed to raise its green share of official development assistance, ODA, above the average of the OECD members. So targets are impressive so far, although the question is about implementation. So this is my second point. Lastly, most importantly, the South Korea has technological readiness to lead global net zero race because the country has global leading companies and the startups that can support green transition at home and abroad. So for instance, South Korea is a rechargeable batteries powerhouse. One of the rechargeable batteries powerhouse with approximately 30% of global share with LG Energy Solution, SK on the Samsung SEI and has good solar and wind manufacturers such as HANA QCell, CS Wind and et cetera. And has one of the leading electric vehicle manufacturer which is Hyundai uh, Motor Company. And also the country has been significantly invest, investing in hydrogen industry and has top tier technology in nuclear power industry. At the same time, there are many South Korean startups rising and being pushed toward uh, net zero, for instance, from a drone inspection company for onshore and offshore wind turbines, an onshore type wave energy developer, a food upcycling firm developing a flower alternative from beer byproducts, ag tech companies working on plant-based meat, vertical farming, precision agriculture, among others. So these rising um, advanced technologies from large companies and startups across vital supply chains, across energy, agriculture, waste, transport, and other sectors can be applied in several um, other economies, especially emerging economies, as a form of um, so-called the climate tech transfer. For instance, from the climate mitigation point of view, many Southeast Asian countries were pressured to transform their mm -hmm. fossil fuel-based economy into green economy, although they don't have technology, they don't have financial resources, and et cetera. If South Korean um, ODA significantly finances leveraging that transition of these emerging economies by supporting solar, wind, and other forms of clean energy development, hypothetically, as well as electric vehicle transition, that could be one of the excellent ways of showcasing the climate leadership. This will not only uh, about contributing to global net zero um, transition, but more about gaining next generation economy opportunities as well for South Korea. So in conclusion, all in all, the tackling climate crisis in a proactive manner is one of the straightforward ways of becoming so-called, quote, more responsible member of the international community, community, unquote, which was one of the major themes that the South Korean President Yoon song Yeo stressed in his inauguration speech. Now, I think um, the South Korea is strategically positioned to take a climate leadership based on their policy readiness global commitment, and then their technological advancement. Okay. The question is how well the country will implement the, these ambitious plans and targets, and how effectively it partners with other neighboring countries by generating tangible climate mitigation and adaptation benefits. i stop here. Thank you for listening to you, right. Professor Lee. Okay, thank you so much for your initial comments. Let me just briefly, uh, in, in two minutes in le or less, share with you uh, my thoughts on Dr. Chung Guyan's article. And what he basically stressed was the che balls in Korea, some of them that Jun just mentioned, whether it's SK or Samsung or Hyundai um, and, and LG and so forth, these large conglomerates actually went through wrenching change during the 1997-98 Asian financial crisis. So he argues that these companies act, were forced to reform and that really, really spurred Korea's innovation chain throughout the 2000s and into 2020s. And, and so when we hit the pandemic and the Ukrainian war, he argues that if 
and this is a big if, if the Korean companies are able to maintain their innovative spirit together with startups and deregulate the economy, he feels that this could be a second, uh, I guess, spur for Korean competitiveness. Uh, my, 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 my essay on national security, I'll be very, very brief. My main argument was that because Korea faces both traditional and non-traditional security issues, it is paramount that South Korea undertake a bottom-up review on national security issues. And ever since democratization in 1987, all incoming countries have done some type of defense reform, but none have undertaken national security from a total uh, perspective. As Chuhan and, and Hannah and Jacob mentioned, for example, how many leaders in Korea or other capitals for that matter really know AI or quantum computing or EVs and so forth. And so the political bodies must really understand that they are going to face a very different world in the next 10, 20 years. Now, what I would like to do, is I'll, I'll pose very quick questions to all of you. So please answer me in about a minute or two at the most, because then I do have some questions from the audience and then I'll have a follow-up questions. Let me first go with, with and you know the Korean political scene extremely well as a member of the uh, Tomo Ilbo and as a member of Tomo Ilbo's editorial board and also having served as bureau chief here in Washington. Is Korea's political divide a very big impediment for Korea's global competitiveness? In other words, because the Koreans, it seems to me anyways, are always fighting on domestic political issues, will this tie them down? Yeah, uh, very good question. Uh, first of all, I just want to make it clear that no one would deny the, uh, the leading party and the opposition party altogether as well, uh, the importance of uh, supporting Korea's attempt to uh, strengthen its global competitiveness. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is a bipartisan goal that goes beyond a political point of view or any ideology. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the approaches, I mean, the method of how to achieve it could uh, be different and it worsens. Uh, the political conflicts, uh, I think it's been deteriorating, actually. So uh, K-CHIPS legislation could be one pertinent example, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it is a bill, I would explain it as a Korean version of Chi uh, Chips and Science Act mm -hmm. in the United States to support Korean semiconductor uh, industry. So it contains comprehensive measures, including tax credit, um, financial support, and lifting regulations. So uh, the semiconductor is the key strategic product in the 21st century, uh, spare and shield at the same time for Korea's global competitiveness, right? But then the Democratic Party opposed the bill saying that it gives uh, preferential treatment uh, to the conglomerates such as Samsung and SK Hynix. Mm -hmm. They say it will give perk uh, and give benefits only for the rich and rich companies. So, yeah. So these kind of things make it worse and weaken the competitiveness, I think. Mm. Okay. Of course, we'll have to wait until April 2024 when we have critical National Assembly elections and see which party gains the majority at that time. Shifting on sure. to you, Chuhan, you argued that South Korea is pivoting towards a greener growth strategy and that despite all the challenges, it has made some pretty critical inroads as one of Asia's largest economies. But so long as China plays a huge role in determining Korea's eco footprint, are there limits to what a green Korea can do? Well, um, say that again, please, the last part. Yeah, my, the question was, as long as China plays such an important role in determining, you know, the ec the eco ecological footprint of the Korean Peninsula, uh, are there limits to what a green Korea can do? In other words, unless China really ramps up its green growth strategy, even if Korea does something on its own, will that really make a difference? Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. And then, well, it reminds uh, me of um, some sort of, the, you know, you know, the cross-border issue of the air quality issue because mm -hmm. the China has a lot of coal fire power plants, um, you know, up and running, and then some, you know, seasonal. There's a seasonal, if you know, impact um, from China to Korea. So that's one of the um, um, one of the diplomatic um, issues that we've been facing. 
Well, scientifically, um, the I, I should bring, you know, um, to verify the figure, but um, the, the influence from China um, to Korea in terms of air quality, uh, I think it was less than 50 percent, 40 percent influence of the, the bad air quality of the Korea. But well, you know, nonetheless, um, the point is, uh, well, I mean, it's, we, we are not in a situation um, um, that, you know, because of you know, China's, um, you know, I mean, we, 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 a lot depend on the China's action. We are not in a situation like that because the South Korea is now one of the leading countries, like I wrote, um, in terms of um, committing to the global uh, net zero transition. And then we have the very ambitious target. It's a, one of the leading um, the figure uh, in terms of the number. And also uh, the South Korean economy has been, um, trying to uh, shift, well, although we have some um, hassles and then some delays in, during uh, the political changes, but overall, since 2008, um, when the South Korea for the first time introduced the concept of the low carbon green growth, actually we've been um, bearing some fruit out of it. So that's why we have, um, you know, uh, electric, you know, uh, no, it's rechargeable battery powerhouse like the Samsung SDI and then, LG Energy Solution because they started to invest in those technologies back then. So now we are um, somehow bearing the fruit. So, um, well, you know, directly responding to your question is, I, I think it's no, because um, one, um, we still have a lot of room to um, transform our own economy domestically. And also there are a lot of, lot of opportunities mm -hmm. for our companies to invest in um, emerging economies by utilizing our experience and technology that we have um, held by our uh, startups and then also the larger conglomerates. There are a lot of um, investment opportunities because these um, de developing countries, emerging economies, they are also pressured uh, by the climate goals and then pressures from the advanced countries. And then the whole global supply chain will be transformed anyway, because by, let's say by 2050, there, there will not be, I mean, there will not be any sales, any new sales of um, in, internal combustion engine based vehicles. So Hyundai Motor Company or the Chinese brand or US brand, they were not going to sell um, any ICE vehicles, so to speak. Then, then these emerging economies who, who is basically adopting the advanced economies transition, they need to transform their economy. They need to transform domestic supply chain as well. So the opportunities out there, so whether it's South Korea or Japan or China or any other countries to uh, jump in um, to, uh, you know, untap opportunities. I just finish if, I mean, after I sh share one example, the Tesla recently invested in Indonesia, a huge, huge investment because Indonesia has the largest nickel reserve um, of the world. So then the, the battery, um, you know, nickel is uh, one of the most important, uh, you know, raw material for the battery. Um, so, you know, Tesla basically they need to have some sort of um, 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 the reserve for their own operation. And the Hyundai, Hyundai Motor Company, and then Energy Solution, LG Energy Solution, recently invested in Indonesia as well. And there are a lot of similar opportunities in developing countries holding the raw materials related to uh, the green transition. So, I think um, going forward. Um, the South Korea needs to look beyond the okay. domestic issues in terms of okay. interest. So thank you. Okay. All right, great. So you're telling me that actually, as long, so long as the Korean companies are able to really innovate in the green space, China is an important factor, but it will not dominate Korea's strategy on, on future uh, greener growth. Now, turning to Hannah and Jacob, or Jacob and Hannah, so let's reverse the order for two seconds. You know, both Korea and Japan are caught in the vice of U.S.-China tech wars. And this is unavoidable, right? So will AI, in your view, uh, will the AI revolution make life more difficult for Japan and Korea? Or will South Korea and Japan's competitive edges in their own ways in AI really help them traverse the U.S.-China tech wars? Jacob? Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's a very interesting question. I think we've we've seen uh, we've seen the semiconductor value chain, for example, become increasingly more relevant as you know mm -hmm. 
national security concerns associated with it kind of rose to the, the front or rose to, uh, to light in, uh, in national capitals around the world. And I think it's an interesting question about whether or not that will continue to be the case. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll scope down your question to, to focus specifically on semiconductors for a minute. And there's uh, some speculation, for example, from uh, Tim Huang, uh, who published a really great piece mm -hmm. with uh, Emily Weinstein uh, by a CSET. And, and one of the things that they, they talk a little bit about in this piece is that uh, compute intensive uh, machine learning might not necessarily be the future. So there, there's might, a lot might of- not. Might not be. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of, of effort being expended in the research space to look at low compute options for machine learning. So you could imagine hypothetically a future where, uh, where compute is not as important for, mm -hmm. uh, for machine learning and, and therefore for some parts of, or some, some uh, dimensions of AI. And if that's the case, then maybe the, the semiconductor value chain also uh, becomes slightly less geopolitically important. Um, that, you know, we're gonna have to watch to see whether or not that actually happens. But I'm, I'm pointing this out just to, to, to make the case that uh, the, the idea that semiconductors and the semiconductor value chain will continue to be as important as it is now, or even more so, that is an assumption. It's not necessarily something we know to be fact. Okay, um, I, I have a mini question for you, but I'll wait for two seconds. Hannah, please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think it's important to note that um, for Korea and Japan especially, they will need to navigate um, these current U.S.-China tensions as well as figure out ways to respond to U.S. efforts to compel um, its allies like South Korea and Japan to reshore critical segments of the supply chain. Um, whether that be through reshoring or friendshoring. But at the same time, um, it's important to note that um, Japanese and South Korean firms derive a lot of their revenue from China. So I think, like Jacob said, it will be kind of a balancing act for these firms in South Korea as they navigate um, dual concerns about maintaining competitiveness, maintaining economic security, while also um, making sure that their firms are still able to have um, a lead in and have access to Chinese markets. Okay, you know, Chuhan, let me just turn to you briefly and, and please answer me briefly as, as you can. Since you're based in the Philippines and the Philippines has had a remarkable economic growth over the last several years, it is one of the emerging economies as we speak in Southeast Asia, right? So from a Southeast Asian angle, how do they see the importance of a greener growth economy? Aren't they more interested in getting out of the so-called poverty trap, making sure that the middle classes become larger? And if that's the case in the Philippines, for example, where you are, what's the priority of having more greener strategies? I think, um, um, Jongmin, the most important thing is to, uh, well, yes, development um, aspiration is still there. So poverty is still there. Um, but it, what's important is um, there are a lot of commitment, uh, especially financial commitment from advanced countries in terms of the, the climate um, the crisis concerns. So there are, um, there are um, for instance, there are 100, you know, $100 billion um, commitment um, to the Green Climate Fund, for instance, so which is mandated to support the developing countries to adapt, you know, climate change, basically. So in, in terms of climate change, you have two, two concepts like climate mitigation. Mitigation is basically to reduce um, the greenhouse gas emission by um, transforming the economy or infrastructure, et cetera. And then adaptation is just to um, cope with um, the changing climate, such as natural disasters and et cetera. So to deal with both mitigation and adaptation, uh, the developing countries like you know Philippines or Southeast Asia, they need to um, adopt, um, they need to, get some you know technology transport they need to um, get some you know assistance in terms of dealing with that adaptation issues etc so that's um that's my simple answer and also um thought about um listening to jacob and hannah uh, talking about ai and the machine learning um there's a very interesting um need in, in you know the countries like philippines indonesia etc in the rural areas um how would i say um if you are the governor of um, one province, 
you, you don't have a, a GI, digitized GIS map data, so to speak. So the climate adapt, in terms of the climate adaptation, you have an infrastructure located here and there. And then there are certain areas that you uh, receive you know, typhoon um, frequently, but the, the policymakers, they don't really have, um, um, they don't really have a clue because you know, their um, province, the, the map is not digitized. So you really don't know, have the socioeconomic information in one map data. So recently I had an interesting chat with one of um, the AI machine learning developer that if we can um, somehow utilize those technology to map out um, the rural areas of these developing countries, then you know the, the governors, the government leaders, they can have more informed decision quite quickly. Right, Stuart, I, uh, we, since yeah. we only have about you know 20 minutes left, uh, I'll yeah. get back to you later on. I do want to bring in the audiences because we have some pretty good, really interesting questions. Let me ask uh, Hannah and Jacob to take this question. It's from Martin uh, Pinero. He says, how do you see decoupling and French shoring affecting Korean development in high technology industries? How do you think Korea should or could respond? So give us your, your takes on this, Hannah. Yeah, I'll take a first stab at it. And I think Jacob will have more things to say. Okay. But I think it's important to note that if you look at the supply, if you look at the supply chain of semiconductors, for example, it involves hundreds of steps that are spread across many different mm -hmm. countries. So ultimately, even as the US, South Korea are trying to engage in these reshoring um, initiatives, at the same time, it's an, important to take a realistic approach to it. I don't know if um, full reshoring is even remotely possible and that okay. it's, um, so that's basically my mm -hmm. take on that. Mm -hmm. okay. Jacob? Yeah. No, I, uh, Hannah brings up a really great point, which is that, I mean, we live in a globalized world that is maybe becoming slightly less, uh, slightly less globalized, but even so, um, you know, to believe that the United States, for example, could, could fully reshore the semiconductor supply chain, I think is, is a myth. Um, I, I think there's this really interesting question about what friend shoring looks like. It's a term that a lot of U S government, uh, officials have, have, um, mentioned at this point. Um, and I, I think how they operationalize it could have uh, strong um, impl or serious implications for South Korea. Um, and I, I think it, there, there's some onus also on the South Korean government to maybe force uh, US interlocutors to be very specific about the, the concerns that they have. So for example, you know, if, if the United States is primarily, you know, if, if in reshoring semiconductor production, it's primarily worried about a scenario um, where there is a conflict over the Taiwan Strait, then that shouldn't uh, prevent investment, French shoring investment in South Korea. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I would hope that uh, Korean government officials would maybe make this point to their US counterparts and also maybe try to uh, elicit the, the concerns that that um, U.S. interlocutors are 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 uh, worried about, because uh, yeah, again, you know, if if um, what you're really worried about is Taiwan, then why not try to uh, move some production, not necessarily out of East Asia, but to a friendly country in the region? Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay. Well, you know, uh, Chongun, I want you to answer this question if you can. It's a difficult one post by Chauncey Daubry, and she says, should we understand South Korea's competitiveness as similar or distinct from the idea of strategic competition in the US? I, I think what she's really saying is, you know, the US really focuses on China, 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 right? And mm -hmm. so what she's saying is, does Korea's global competitiveness mean also China, 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 or is there something else? Well, um, the... South Korea's position regarding China is really complicating. Uh, as you all know, um, we are heavily dependent on our uh, security to our ally, the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, but China is also our number one trading partner. Mm -hmm. So we have to, uh, we've been trying to, the Korea has been trying to uh, balance between two countries. So we focus on the security, national security to 
the United States, whereas when we have uh, dealing with the economy, it's always been about China. But now it's like a de facto, we are like kind of uh, in force to choose one of the side. Mm. So uh, a lot of Koreans are worried and concerned about uh, the possibility of losing the big market in China. And then it could be uh, the weakening point of our competitiveness. But uh, still, uh, we are now trying to, how can I say, expand and uh, verify, uh, I mean, uh, the expand the markets, not only to China, but to other countries, even like NATO, Europe, and ASEAN countries. So um, the strategy competition is a, definitely a challenge to us. Uh, but recently, for example, the President Yoon uh, attended the NATO meeting. It was the first time that the Asian, uh, the, the Korean, president attended NATO in Europe. Uh, it was an observer country, but still it, it has some meaning. And then at the time, uh, the government officials like really uh, uh, focused on the fact that, okay, maybe the best time in China is now gone. And then maybe we have to find another uh, possibilities and new uh, like uh, uh, opportunities in other markets. So uh, definitely, uh, the strategic competition in the U.S. between the U.S. and the China is a challenge, but it still has uh, uh, room for us to stay in the middle and uh, have to make the most of it. So I think um, could be similar because we are we stand with the United States and we try to uh, align our um, policies more with the United States because the president Yoon wants to uh, strengthen the U.S. alliance and the bilateral co cooperations and relationships better. But we'll see uh, the China still matters for us too. Okay. You know, Chuhan, I want to turn this question around before final comments from all of you from the Millennium Project. And they're asking whether there is any room for any synergistic cooperation between the Japanese and Koreans. So my question to you, simply uh, a little bit amended, is this. Is it possible for Korea and Japan to cooperate on green growth? Well, I'm a practitioner, um, uh, Jongmin, so I'm just I'm talking based on um, the, the practical point of view. So, well, the, the Korean government established the Global Green Growth Institute and also hosted uh, United Nations Green Climate Fund um, for the green activities. Mm -hmm. And then the Japan, they uh, established IGES. I um, need to come back with the full uh, name of the institution, but it's an environmental institution, which is also global. Um, but honestly, it has been um, because of um, the, the diplomatic relationship for the, for the recent years between the, the Republic of Korea and then Japan. And so it also affected um, the relationship on the, the green, you know, coalition, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it has been, practically speaking, it's not really easy to collaborate um, with the Japanese um, branded, um, the green, um, you know, activities. For instance, I mean, here uh, or in Southeast Asia, I sometimes meet with the Japanese government officials in the JICA, uh, in the conference and et cetera, but we don't um, have a um, collaboration project, um, as mm -hmm. simply put. So it's been... Um, affected by the diplomatic relationship. And then it's been, although it's a um, um, you know, relationship on the global commons, but it's it's been difficult. That's my yeah. short answer. Well, uh, that's a very, very interesting take. The reason I say that is because of course, you know, the Japanese Korean relationship is a very difficult one uh, over historical and other issues. But I sincerely believe that unless these two critical economic powers in Asia are able to really cooperate on a range of global issues, uh, the, the only voice in town will be China's. And that is to the detriment of, you know, all, all of us in, the, in this room. So as we, as, as we wind down, one, I really want to ask you guys one final question and then with, with, with closing comments. So let me go to, uh, to Jim. Looking ahead, how do you see, what should President Yoon and the government prioritize as he mm -hmm. wants to become a much more important player in the global stage. You know, Korea cannot do everything. That's what I'm saying. So if you had to, mm -hmm. as, as an observer of Korean uh, affairs, what should the Yoon Sung yeol government really emphasize in the next four and a half years? Um, well, as I already explained, well, uh, the first goal is 
uh, to strengthening alliance. Uh, Yoon's diplomacy team thinks that relationship uh, between the two countries weakened during the uh, Moon Jae-in administration, and now he wants to uh, get it back. So that would be the number one goal. And based on those firm um, relationships now, um, the current, the most important issue is to respond to the North Korea's nuclear threat. So um, like North Korea has been like, a, a, do a lot of provocations like launching missiles. And then uh, now it tries to uh, have uh, the seventh nuclear test. So now the UN administration tries to strengthening the extended deterrence, the nuclear umbrella. And mm -hmm. um, now some people in Korea now um, saying that we have to have our own nuclear arsenals, which is not possible for the time being. So mm -hmm. instead of that, the extended deterrence will be the main target for the time being. And the third, I think, um, economic e security. So the President Yoon focused a lot about the importance of emphasized uh, the economic security. So it's not about the traditional security thing, mm -hmm. but it's not only about trade. It's like all mixed one. So you have to think very strategically in terms of uh, the security of the economic uh, issues like China, semiconductor, EV batteries, IRA, and things like that. And finally, all like including this, like uh, President Yoon really like uh, the uh, the freedom. Like every his speech, he says something about freedom, mm -hmm. and he wants to make it in a like a value diplomacy. So as I told you, it be it would be about democracy and and the dev the values that mm -hmm. we cherish, and that we have aligned uh, together with the United States. So we'll see all these kind of things. But um, the main challenge would be China as well. And uh, for frankly speaking, I I don't see any strategic concept or strategy to respond to the China's let's mm. say potential um the retaliation or whatever yeah. but um we'll see and then I'm sure that they will be ready in some time you know Chuhar you deal you work a lot both with the policy sector with governments and with the private sector and so if you had to look into the future of Korea's you know greener uh growth strategy how can you make Korean companies much more competitive in the global market square, but also leaders in green technology and, and, and products. In other words, well, can you make money and become greener at the same time? Uh, yes, it, it is possible, uh, um, Professor Lee. And then maybe I can give you two simple points. Mm -hmm. um, the number one is um, the Korean government um, can be more... Um, strongly involved in the climate discourse uh, in the, the global diplomacy as a mediator between advanced countries and then developing countries. One um, simple example is uh, the recent methane pledge. So President yeah. Biden, um, you know, during the, the conference parties of the UNFCCC, you know, 26, uh, you know, conference party of the UNFCCC, he made a pledge on methane reduction. And then during the last summit between the Korea and the U.S., the President Yoon um, included uh, the commitment, the financial commitment from Korean government to support President Biden's methane pledge in Asian market, Southeast yeah. Asian yeah. market. That's a very good diplomacy. They're a very good example. So if they can um, materialize that kind of support by financing the Southeast Asian countries to reduce methane, then that's a, a good opportunity. I think it, that was a good idea uh, of the new government. So that's number one. And then the number two um, is basically the South Korean government can, um, they need to innovate their ODA policies. They need to um, give more opportunities for not only the large conglomerates uh, working uh, in the climate tech space, but also the startups to go out the startups they need a uh, offering capital to uh, you know um, to take care of their first loss um, you know um, in, in expanding in the overseas market basically especially in the emerging economy so they need to invest more um, so grant capital or any kind of um, patient capital to support uh, the South Korean based climate tech companies to go overseas and they make JVs and then you know embedded in the um, new market especially in the emerging economy and then you know, obviously they will have um, new economy opportunities, the revenues and et cetera, 
while making um, the the partners' economy um, green. So thank you, Jomi. All right, um, Hannah and Jacob. Uh, very quickly, if Korea and Japan have no choice but to really ramp up its work on AI and other key technologies, whether it's quantum computing and so forth, will this enable Korea's competitiveness competitiveness to really grow? Um, definitely, Chung Ming. Um, I just want to highlight the fact that AI will be a key tool to manage all of Korea's challenges and some of these challenges that the compendium authors have also addressed, such as aging demographics or climate change mitigation. So really figuring out how to harness the power of AI in different sectors and to tackle various challenges, I think will be key for Korea's future. Jacob, famous last words. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I think that that was perfect. I'll just add one quick thing about global supply chains, which I, I think this realignment is going to mm -hmm. present challenge or already is presenting challenges, mm -hmm. you know, as for example, the U.S. pressures South Korea and Japan to, uh, you know, uh, stop some of their exports to China. So there's a risk of loss of sales to China, but there are also opportunities for South Korea, um, opportunities to attract new investment, for example, as companies seek to move some of their operations out of China to friendlier shores. Okay. You know, as I wind this uh, uh, webinar down, let me just say a couple of words and then we will close. First of all, let me thank Alex Taylor and all my friends at the Asia program for making this happen all the time. The second point is when I see Hannah and Jacob and Chu Hearn and Chung Un, I am really, really proud that I'm here with next generation leaders. You may, you may not remember this because you were born after me, but I was also a young leader once. But I think in this way, you know, you are passing the baton to the next generation. And Chuhan, I'm so proud that you're in Manila working on great things and making green growth happen both in Southeast Asia and Korea. And we want you back in Korea one of these days. You've done, it's done, you've done tremendous work. Uh, chong -un, you've watched what's happening all over the world as far as Korean foreign policy is concerned. So as a journalist, you must always be extremely cautious and basically tell the Yun government or any other governmental entity, not only the, the things that they do well, but also the things that they don't do well. So you've got to be a really, you, you have to have eagle eyes as Korea's comp competitiveness goes forward. Last but not least to, to Hannah and Jacob, you both of you are the future, not only on, on AI, I, uh, but on, on all the issues that we speak. So the fact that, that all of us multi-generationally are here today really is a symbol of where I think the world is headed and the work that Carnegie does in its all small way to make sure that we are able to provide not solutions per se, but insights from multi-generational, multicultural, and, and, and multi, I guess, dimensional views so that at some point in time, someone out there will look at this webinar and the things that you have written and say, aha, I think this is the pathway to perhaps a solution to all the challenges we face. So let me thank all of my colleagues uh, here today and for sharing your, your thoughts at such a late hour, chong in Korea and chu in Manila and Hannah and Jacob. Uh, so, so thank you all. And I really hope that we will be able to keep in touch and perhaps do a second compendium next year on a, on a similar but a different topic. Thank you so much also to our uh, audiences online for their questions and, and, and insights as well. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time.